May I extend to you all a hearty welcome, herzlich willkommen to Oslo, and uh, please switch off your mobile phones. My, my name is uh, Rolf Einar Fifa. I'm um, the head of the legal department of the Foreign Ministry and uh, chair of the Norwegian branch of the International Law Association. And it is uh, a great uh, pleasure uh, to uh, basically um, welcome uh, one of the most eminent international lawyers uh, to uh, this session, which uh, is going to be extremely interesting for a large number of reasons. Um, Bruno Zima, Professor Z Bruno Zima does not actually need any introduction. Any of you who have been dealing with uh, any practical or theoretical aspects, uh, even remotely linked to international law, will have um, met his, on his name whether it is uh, as a practitioner looking uh, uh, feverishly through uh, uh, the uh, commentaries uh, to the UN Charter, or whether you've been reading judgments of the International Court of Justice. Uh, the list of merits is long. Um, Professor Zimmer, you were born, uh, I think, in uh, Saar in uh, Germany, which is uh, at the core of uh, developments in Europe uh, throughout the 20th century. You sp spent um, time in Innsbruck uh, academically and then 30 years in Munich and uh, built up uh, a uh, reputation as uh, one of the most outstanding um, uh, theoreticians within international law. Uh, you spent the last nine years um, as a judge of the International Court of Justice and uh, have now uh, uh, returned to uh, academia keeping a foot both in the old world. We understand you spend uh, and have spent a lot of time not only in continental Europe, including the old world, uh, Siena, Florence, but also in the new world, Ann Arbor, Michigan, among other places. I was struck by the fact that one of the first publications you issued in 1970 was called as Reciprocitätselement in der Entstehung des Völkergewöhnheitsrechts, which in Norwegian might be translated as uh, Jens uh, Idiot, some uh, element in upcomes now said on it. Much easier in Norwegian, as you may understand. And it's striking that um, one of the issues that the International Law Commission is struggling with now as we speak is the fundamental understanding of what is customary law. I'm not sure whether you will touch upon that at all, but uh, through your publications and through your judicial activity, you have certainly been covering all of the most interesting parts of international law. And we have the great privilege of having associate professor uh, Christina Fucht, who will um, lead you through, lead you all through, a series of questions in a friendly interview uh, where we will basically imagine that we're sitting by behind, beside the fireplace, having uh, a, com a conversation with no witnesses present. Up to you, Christina. Thank you very much, Rolf Einer Fiefe. Professor Simmer, in your long career in international law, you've had many hats. You professor at various internationally renowned law schools. You are a prolific academic writer on timely and fundamental topics of international law. You have served as a member of the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, of the International Law Commission. You have worked as a practitioner, uh, as a counsel in a number of cases before the ICJ, though never on the losing side, I learned. But earlier this year, as we just heard, you finished a position we are all fascinated by your nine-year term as judge at the International Court of Justice in The Hague. As we have many students here today and staff that work and study in uh, international law, we are of course eager to learn what does it mean to be a judge at an international court and what has been, is and will be the contribution of international judges to the making and to the developing of international law in addressing contemporary challenges. Want to, me to go on for one 
colleague of mine, Nabil El Arabi from Egypt, left the court. He made a little speech, and I remember he said uh, the greatest thing about coming to The Hague was that, so he had been a legal advisor to the Egyptian government, uh, Camp David negotiations, this kind of thing, and he said the, the greatest thing coming to, for the first time in his life, he felt free. In my immediate reaction was, in my case, it was exactly the opposite way. Uh, I was always, I felt very free because as a professor, at least in Germany, you can say what you want. I mean, you really have academic freedom. And as a judge at the ICJ, you are really, uh, you, you experience many limitations. Of course, also because you have 14, at least 14, up to 16 colleagues who might have another view and cannot be convinced, and that's something which as a professor you are not used to anyway, right? Uh, you can, once in an academic seminar, after the third person has said the same thing, you can say, well, okay, I think we have had enough, let's turn to the next question. But in a court, of course, you have to listen to all 15, and it would be great if they all say the same thing. So this is a bit an impressionistically uh, my reaction to your question, what does, it, what does it feel, what is life like as an international judge? I'm sure you meant it a bit more, you know, loftily, so it, it is, it was great to be an international judge. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, the second half of my question referred to the development of international law, the making, the, the room for manoeuvre that you as a judge actually have. Uh, you, in, in one of your writings, or many of your writings, you commented on the, the deference or the respect of the International Court of Justice to national sovereignty of its users, the states that accept the court's jurisdiction. Would you say that this respect for the sovereignty of uh, of states actually amounts to an obstacle to the development, to the dynamic development of international law? Again, I, I start with a personal remark. I remember I was always struck, you, you, you enter the Peace Palace and you enter a different world. You come from an academic environment in which, let's say, not maybe almost the majority of writers would take the view that sovereignty is something that we have fortunately overcome, or if uh, people retain the, the notion of sovereignty, it's some kind of enlightened sovereignty or responsibility to protect like sovereignty. But in the Peace Palace, uh, sovereignty is, is uh, alive and well, and also kicking, kicking. I mean, you, you see that this is not a European Court of Justice, this is not a European Court of Human Rights, this is a, a global court, and you realize that in other parts of the world, particularly if, uh, on the part of countries and representatives of countries who have uh, gained independence a few decades ago, sovereignty is really something of, of great value, and it serves as a, a protection against all kinds of what people regard as intrusions or, or interventions. So I think sovereignty uh, has, to me, a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, makes a lot of good sense. But of course, I'm aware of the, of the fact that it can also play the role of an inhibiting element. Um, if you try to, like in a bar, you know, uh, do some kind of a mix, uh, so the, the mix would be, the person would be about in, in his early 60s, I say his because the masculine elements in that person would prevail, even though not as strongly as they did, I don't know, like 15 years ago. And he, that he, with a very small she, would, be, uh, would have been a career diplomat, maybe teaching at night, uh, posted in, in, in New York and Geneva, but maybe having been legal advisor at least for part of the career. So that would be the, the mix, well shaken, the, the average judge or the prototype judge that you still have there. Mm -hmm. um, so so there, you, you say then the minority would be academics that mm -hmm. enter the, the your, your, your academic background uh, 
did you feel sometimes a certain amount of frustration or that your academic soul actually wanted to push the, 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 the issue at stake a bit further, but you felt restrained, as you said, or very limited in, in what you actually were allowed to do? Mm. Um, so that, that you had, in a way, a struggle inside of you going on where you had the academic head or the academic person on the one side and, and then the, the judge on the other side and you had to fight it in, inside of you. Okay, now you have asked me a more personal question, I'll give my answer in a more general way, right? <laughs> I think the court has gone through various phases. For instance, if you look at the 1980s, around the time of the, uh, let's say, Nicaragua judgment, I think the court had, uh, um, if you read, for instance, a judgment like Nicaragua, and I'm, I'm not dealing with the, let's say, the more problematic or, or contentious parts of the Nicaragua judgment. But you can see people wrote uh, not just to decide the case, but also to, to teach, to teach the environment. I remember um, Judge Lux at the time, one of the probably most uh, important judges at the court, just turned out for some reason to like me and we went into long discussions and then he, he described what he had, let's say, placed and squeezed into the Nicaragua judgment and what he had done, you know. He, he had been very proud, he said, for instance, you, you, you know who in 1974 wrote this great thing things about the binding nature of unilateral commitments into the judgment was me, you know. And so, so, okay, but what you meant, that there was a, a judge who had been a teacher, and actually one, I think, of judge Manfred Lux's last books was Teachers and Teaching in International Law, so teacher. And they regard, these people regarded the court also as a teaching institution, a bit like uh, my let's say, recent colleague, Cansado Trindagi. I think he would be a typical example. But again, the great majority of judges nowadays regard the, the court as a court. They would say, our task is to decide the cases, and we are not going to write academic treatises into the judgment. So I think the court is undergoing a phase that you, I think, could call with George Abisab, a, a transaction where the jurisprudence is very transactional. The court gets cases, the court deals with these cases, the court says what it has to say, and the court doesn't say anything uh, in addition. And it's very, very difficult to, 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 let's say, try to convince colleagues that they could say a little bit more here and there. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest international, arguably, international lawyers ever to have studied at this faculty, mm -hmm. Edward Humbro, commented on the tension in international law between the needs for stabilization and the needs of development as it may be felt by the International Court of Justice, of which, by the way, he was the first oh. registrar in 1946 to 53. Uh, he wrote, on the one hand, the court should be a stabilizing influence. The law is always to some extent static and represents the forces of society at the time when the law was made. On the other hand, all law is in constant development. If law becomes too conservative and relies too much on precedent, it may become fossilized. We must guard against such a danger. We live in a dynamic society. New needs must be met all the time. International law must participate in this development. These were his words. So this, of course, relates to the clarification of customary norms, of customary law, and also to the interpretation of treaties. And I'd like to talk a little bit about interpretation. The court famously tackled the issue of evolutionary interpretation in the, in the navigational rights uh, uh, case between um, uh, Costa Rica and, and Nicaragua in 2009, and the same issue was tackled by the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the PCA, in the Iron Rhine case. In Iron Rhine, <coughs> where you sit, or sat, you and your colleagues said that the object and purpose of a treaty, taken together with the intentions of the parties, are the prevailing elements for interpretation. Now, the question is, how do you see these issues that Hambro mentions, the struggle between stabilization and development, and which come up regularly before international courts uh, and, and tribunals, the interplay in a treaty between its object and purpose, the intention of the parties, and its evolution. Are these elements in conflict with one each other, or do they actually, on the contrary, very often pull in the same direction? Very impressive questions, and 
they show a little trend. You are an environmental lawyer, right? And uh, okay. Uh, let, let me try. Let me try the questions in part. So the first part would be this Hambro, Hambro's, uh, let's say, on the international law having to be on a, some kind of a uh, march between ossification of the law and and development. I think there you really have to see very much depends on the cases that the court deals with. I'll give you exam an example for both, uh, uh, let's say, uh, sides of that, uh, let's say, thin line on which the court has to walk. Um, let's say quite a number of uh, decisions of the International Court deal with uh, maritime delimitation or maybe delimitation of uh, territory on land. Um, and there, I think, the court uh, would have to be very, very careful to, uh, de let's say, leave a line which has been established now for, let's say, for more than four decades since the North Sea Continental Shelf case. So the court has, with regard to maritime delimitation, for instance, developed a certain doctrine. And I think the, the reason why the ICJ is still getting the great majority also of maritime delimitation cases and states having problems of that kind prefer to go to the ICJ. I think this is still valid. I mean, I know the uh, ITLOS, the International Tribunal of the Sea, has recently gotten its first delimitation case. Fine, let's see where the, the trend will, uh, what, what trend will uh, continue. But the reason is a fixed jurisprudence on which states can rely. Okay, so that would be example for a, a field of international law where, let's say, courageous ideas, new, new concepts don't make much sense. I remember that uh, my court in a case between uh, Nicaragua and Honduras on maritime delimitation used a method different from the, from the methods it had this, uh, used earlier. And that, so this is, uh, this is an, an example of where the court is well advised to stick to a, an established jurisprudence. On the, on the other hand, the negative example where the court was not well advised not to take up new trends was of course the jurisprudence or, or better the, the lack of jurisprudence on the, the notion of use Kogans. Use Kogans, something which had been around like my, my great mentor Alfred Ferdros was probably one of the let's say leading uh, proponents of use Kogans on the basis of his natural law doctrine. Then you have the Vienna Conference and you have uh, use Kogans in, in, the, in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Uh, international courts and the European Court of Justice, uh, sorry, European Court of Human Rights uh, accepted use Kogans. It was accepted in, in, a, in a number of other fora. The ICJ went into some kind of contorted uh, uh, moves and spoke of intransgressible. Uh, I think I see Robert Kolb here. You would know all that by heart. But I think it was something like intransgressible, let's say, precepts of humanity, etc., etc., meaning nothing else but use Kogans, but the word use Kogans was just kind of a obscene, not to be used. And this has only very recently been overcome. So there, this would be a good example where the court, uh, where the court would have been well advised to play a leading role uh, and not kind of try to, let's say, work as a break in that regard. So my uh, short answer to your long question would be that very much depends on the cases that you get. Mm. On the other hand, you mentioned the uh, adoption of uh, what we call evolutionary or dynamic treaty interpretation by the court in the, in the judgment, I think in 2009 or 10, it was a judgment which I didn't take part between uh, Costa Rica and, uh, Costa Rica. and again Nicaragua on the uh, San Juan River navigational rights, where you find a couple of paragraphs on evolutionary interpretation, which read as uh, they could have been written in Strasbourg with the European Court of Human Rights. But again, with a personal anecdote, uh, I think dynamic interpretation is great where it fits. I remember I spent a few months with the uh, European uh, 
with the Council of Europe, the, let's say, the, the infrastructure of the European Commission of Human Rights at the time. Um, and I remember a dinner together with uh, the legal advisor of the Austrian government and another person who later become, became a uh, president of Austria. And they had just gotten a terrible beating in the European Commission. And I remember the one of these guys saying, Bruno, that was in 1973, Bruno, if we had known what these people make of that treaty concluded in 1950, we would never have joined. See, so uh, don't take things too far. An example from the, let's say, UN area of human rights would be the, the way in which the uh, UN, the Human Rights Committee, supervising the Covenant on Civil and, uh, and Political Rights, uh, kind of the way they dealt with reservations made by some Caribbean states with regard to the death penalty, where at the end everything was in ruins because the people just said, okay, we are going to leave the optional protocol, the first pro optional protocol to the covenant altogether. So I think it's great to be progressive. It's, it's great to engage in uh, dynamic interpretation of obligations for states uh, deriving from treaties, but you have to, you have to really have a, a nice, a good feeling where you can afford to do that and where not. Sorry. <laughs> in uh, systemic integration entailed in the Article 313C of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which requires that a treaty interpreter takes into account, together with the context, any relevant rules of international law applicable in the relations between the parties. Now, the ICJ's judgment in the oil platforms case has been seen by some as a case where the ICJ went actually too far in taking on board general international law in its interpretation of the treaty before it, which was the 1955 treaty between Iran and the United States. For example, in her dissenting opinion, Dame Rosalind Higgins was critical as to the court's approach. She noted that the court, instead of interpreting the 1955 treaty, used interpretation as a justification to set aside or to sidestep from the treaty and apply outside law. In her, in her words, the court has, however, not interpreted Article 20, Paragraph 1D of that particular treaty by reference to the rules on treaty interpretation, it has rather invoked the concept of treaty interpretation to displace the applicable law. No opinion. On the other hand, by others, uh, judge, uh, by others, the judgment was seen as not going far enough in stating clearly in that particular example that the prohibition on the use of force has mm. used mm. in Who states. might have had this? <laughs> um, in your view, what is the role and the scope of Article 313C of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties? And how do you look back to that debate or discussion mm. in, in, uh, which arose at the time? I think one of us will have to say a little more uh, to the audience because I don't know whether all of them will be aware of the way the International Court applied Article 313C in the oil platforms case. I remember well, oil platforms was my first case. Uh, the, the, what I liked about it was that it had to do with uh, ships, tankers, warships, mines, missiles, and it gave me the chance to establish myself as the number one expert on military hardware within the court because I have to say my colleagues had not, they didn't know anything. They couldn't even distinguish a frigate from a corvette. I mean, you probably, okay. So this, this is easy, right? But the, um, the question was that the, the basis was a treaty concluded between Iran and the United States on friendship, you know, all the things that we have seen in action between the two countries for decades now, friendship, commerce, navigation, and uh, at the end, so freedom of commerce between the countries, and at the end there was a clause which said that states uh, more or less retain the right to take measures that deviate from their treaty obligations in case of uh, necessity or something. So I think the term necessity played in there. Um, and the court um, did not do much about interpreting the terms of the treaty on necessity and measures that states could take in, in, in situations of political, let's say, uh, emergency necessity, but kind of said, we are going to interpret this by 
taking uh, something which the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties says in that famous Article 31.3c, which means that treaties are to be interpreted also in the light of uh, rules of general international law which are applicable between the parties. And there, like in a theater, the ICJ turns the stage around and uh, deals with the question whether, said, okay, we are in general international law, and, um, and when you read the judgment, you see that the first part, part then very unabashedly deals with the question whether uh, the United States have breached Article 2, 4 of the UN Charter, and that is use of force, illegal use of force against, against Iran. Um, and you, you attached to this part, thing you said for, for some people the judgment didn't go far enough. Uh, I was one of the judges for, for which the judgment didn't go far enough, but for another reason. I wasn't uh, dissatisfied with the way uh, the court interpreted the treaty. I thought that the court should have said a little more about the use of force. It should, it, it should have, I mean, we are, we are dealing with a case which, where the oral hearing took place about four weeks before, uh, before uh, the United States invaded Iraq. And everybody knew they would invade. Uh, in such a situation, a judgment which is as coy about 2-4 of the UN Charter, as the oil platform's judgment is, uh, was not satisfactory to me, and that I wrote in the first part of a, of a separate opinion. Um, with regard to the, let's say, this trick of 313C, oh, I thought about it actually this morning on the ship, and I think that Rosalind Higgins is right. I think in that judgment the court took Article 313C too far. I think it, because it was not just an interpretation of the clause in the treaty in the light of generally applicable law, like two paragraph four on non-use of force, it was more. And I think uh, Rosalind Higgins is right, and people like Frank Berman, who also wrote about it, are right. Uh, fortunately, in my separate opinion, I didn't, I, I voted for the judgment, but in my separate opinion, I didn't take up this part. So, um, I think you also have to, how should I say, with me it's like with uh, reading a book by Thomas Mann or by some other writer. I have a hard time with modern linguistic theory to detach the text totally from the author and from the environment. I think I'm a contextualist in that regard. And I think the iron, uh, sorry, not iron, Ryan, the, the oil platform's judgment has to be read also in a situational way. This was a judgment which came about while the sky was getting blacker and blacker. A illegal invasion was underway. Um, um, also a bit the, of course, the personalities of the two countries. I mean, you wonder, Iran, the United States, you know, Iran, the United States, arguing on the basis, still base, uh, arguing on the basis of a treaty of friendship. Uh, very interesting. Very, very complex situation indeed. Um, would you agree that there is a connection between uh, viewing the international legal landscape as a system and the tendency to maybe stretch Article 31.3c rather lengthy, rather long? Because the idea that it is a system means that every single piece can be put in place and in mm. the end, via invoking 313c, we, we arrive at the final beautiful painting. Mm. Well, reading, reading about international law system always makes me realize that I'm not enough French to understand what these people mean. I mean, there are, okay, I'm not going to name any people because this is going to be for eternity uh, and I might lose friends, but... Uh, I mean, my, my, uh, my image of international law as a system is a very, I would say, pre-scientific, pre a very superficial one. But um, applying your judgment, uh, applying this uh, systems theory to the, uh, to the use of 313C, um, I, would, I don't see a connection between, between, let's say, judges with a Franco system in their heads and... Uh, Judge, uh, and judges being, uh, let's say, at the 
at the basis of this. I think if, the, if I'm correct, the ICJ mentioned Article 313C three times, right? For the first time in oil platforms. For the second time in uh, Djibouti against France. Uh, this is a, an instance which I know very well. And for the third time in the case I did not take part on uh, between uh, Romania and um, uh, uh, Ukraine in the... Uh, no, navigational rights, sorry. Navigational rights, Nicaragua, Nicaragua, Costa Rica. Um, I think always applied, maybe with the exception of oil platforms, always applied in a very measured uh, way. So, but as I said, I don't see any great, uh, any great basis in systemat in thinking as international law as a system, etc., and the recourse to 31. The maybe, maybe I could say a word. The the area of international law where 313C is really flourishing, and is is nowadays is um, investment arbitration. But there, I think there, I think the there is a reason. There, I think 313C is really uh, doing good, because the great problem in investment arbitration is that there are. Each of these arbitrations, in a sense, is a little, let's say, legal mini-universe of its own. And there are a lot of um, investment arbitrators which would uh, say no if you ask them, do you make a serious effort to place what you have to say into a system in which precedent plays a role, in which uh, do you take um, uh, a system into, uh, into consideration? Are you willing or are you... Do you know that you might contribute to what people call fragmentation of international law by going into another direction than other investment tribunals did uh, before you, etc.? And there, I think, uh, recourse to 313C helps at least a little bit to keep the, these various little, uh, let's say, fractions together within something that, if you want, you can call a system at least prevent it from going into all kinds of different directions. Since you just mentioned fragmentation, I, I'd like to, to stay a little bit on this issue of fragmentation. As we all know, different states or groups of states sometimes gather in some interest-specific regime, just as you said, maybe an investment treaty or the, the WTO to, to think a bit bigger, trade uh, uh, regime, human rights regimes, climate regime, what, what, uh, what have we, to pursue very different and sometimes conflicting interests. So as a result, a number of international regimes exist that claim to be defined entirely by their own rules, by their own principles, norms, decision-making processes, compliance procedures and so forth. So fragmentation has by some been conceived as a challenge to the universality, global validity and applicability of international law and also to the legal security and the rule of law in international matters, and it is a contentious issue still. However, I have the feeling that in the recent years the voice of fragmentophobia has become less prominent. We haven't really heard that, that much critique recently. And I guess that we can agree that the proliferation of normative uh, rules and structures and tribunals is a necessary development in international law, reflecting the diverse political agendas of the nation states and the rapidly transforming international system. So would you agree that fragmentation in itself is not a negative phenomenon? <coughs> I'm sorry, not a state of normative anarchy, rather that it to a certain extent is a necessity um, if all of the different interests and areas dealt with in international law are to be given due attention. It might even be international law's best justification, as uh, other scholars have commented. Or is it a matter of concern? Well, first of all, I don't like the term fragmentation. I come, I live in Munich, and about two weeks ago in Munich, a bomb from World War II it fragmented and created a lot of damage, going into millions of uh, euros. So uh, what I mean is fragmentation to me is something which belongs into the, uh, let's say, the, the, the world and the language of military people. I don't know where else. I, I can think at least not, not uh, 
quickly of any, if any, let's say, area of life or science where fragmentation is a good thing. So why not, why not, but of course if you are an academic, especially if you are a young academic, especially if you're a, an American academic, you have to be original and you have to be a big piece with 900 footnotes and their fragmentation of course is great. You, 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 you create a danger, you create a straw man which you then destroy in 100 pages in a law journal. Okay, I understand, I understand. This is probably designed to prevent the fragmentation of, a, of an academic career. With regard to international law as such, I, think, I don't see a danger. I think what, I see, what I see at work is I, what I would call a diversification. And this is like, like uh, the development of domestic law over centuries that uh, I think probably in the, let's say, 12th, 13th, 14th century, uh, domestic law was probably on the state of international law like 50 years ago. <laughs> um, and then, and then, you know, separate areas of the law kind of establish themselves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and, and nowadays, uh, domestic law is a highly diversified system of law, uh, sometimes in conflict with other with other branches. And I think that's what you what you see developing in international law. And I see that as a as a sign of international law um, becoming adult, mature. To, to reach uh, a more, uh, let's say, progressed, uh, ripe stage. But of course, that doesn't mean that I don't see dangers here and there, where, uh, for instance, international courts uh, go in different directions. I already mentioned the, the, the danger in, uh, in investment arbitration and jurisprudence. But I'm sure uh, your students are being told the same stories as in München about, you know, like uh, the Nicaragua judgment, and then you have uh, Tadic, and then comes the ICJ, comes back and very politely tells the ICTY, why don't you just leave this stuff to us in the in the genocide case and then you read a fiery piece by Nino Cassese in the European Journal of International Law where he says let's let's have another round unfortunately Nino is not among us and so maybe that since Nino Cassese was probably the one judge of the uh, ICTY who wrote the Tadic judgment or at least these paragraphs um, so there are instances where you see uh, but I see in general international judges and arbitrators are very well aware of the necessity to keep um, keep things together to a bit feel like belonging to the same system quote unquote um, that's yes I think that is the main thing maybe it very much depends of the temperament of judges etc but I think the mainstream is really keep international law together Talking about mainstreaming, in one of your academic publications you write, in my view, the most valuable contribution the ICJ can make to the international protection of human rights, a role for which it is particularly well equipped and pra practically has no competition, consists in what uh, could be called the juridical mainstreaming of human rights in the sense of integrating this branch of the law into the fabric of general international law and its various other branches. <clears throat> Could you please elaborate uh, a little bit on the role of the court in mainstreaming human rights? What, what does it mean exactly? Um, first of all, it always makes uh, an author happy to see or that somebody has actually read what he has written and well, thanks for quoting the most important thing from a recent article I wrote <laughs> about the International Court of Human Rights. On the other hand, it's a bit unfair of you to quote this because I'm supposed to tomorrow speak in a seminar about the same topic and so there won't be any cliffhanger uh, moments anymore <laughs> in the seminar. Uh, what I mean, so I, I mean, let me tell, let me start again with myself a bit. I, when I was uh, in the International Law no, before I joined the International Law Commission, I spent 10 years as a member of one of the UN human rights treaty bodies, namely the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, or as my good friend Philip Austin used to say, Bruno, we are in the Committee on Communist Rights. I mean, that's a, a, all right. So this committee started to work in 1987, and um, 
and that was a great time because the committee wasn't a um, wasn't a treaty body in the proper sense. It was a uh, um, a body which uh, was subject to the NGO regime of the United Nations, which gave us much more freedom uh, than other treaty bodies had at the time. So Philip and I and some other members were really able to develop, you know, just kind of trial by error, learning by doing, but more or less setting or introducing a number of things which later were uh, taken up by the other treaty bodies. Um, so I felt, uh, but soon my feeling was in this treaty body, in the, in the wide sense of the word, I, I'm the guardian of general international law. You know, these, these human rights people sometimes come from directions, have backgrounds which are really kind of ob obscure. <laughs> I know that probably in Norway uh, they are least obscure, but in other parts of the world you simply don't know what are, what is uh, how how serious are these people? Because my view about this treaty body business has always been that states like the treaty bodies. States, of course, are all for human rights, but uh, don't let them be too nasty. You know, so you 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 put the 18 members come from different directions, have a very different degree of knowledge of international law uh, of human rights. I mean, I have to say when I I was joined this treaty body. I, my knowledge of it, I wasn't very interested in human rights, uh, and I had no profound knowledge. But I learned a lot. But as I said, I felt like guarding international law and telling these wild human rights droit de l'homme, what limits international law set. When I joined the International Law Commission, instantly it, the opposite was the case. I felt like a, a human rights person within a bunch of, let's say, cold, uncommitted, cynical, where is Mr. Friede, legal advisors. <laughs> oh, sorry. I mean, you were not there. But, you know, I'm, I'm of course painting all this a bit black and white. But this, these were the generalists. These were the, 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 the foreign office uh, people. And, uh, and some they had the feeling that feeding human rights to these guys would really destroy human rights. I mean, my ideas in that regard are a bit like the, those of Philip Ballot in Eunomia, I think, where he says, you know, the, if you want to really disarm human rights, feed them to the bureaucrats and they will grind it into small change. And at the end, everything in Strasbourg will depend whether Article 6 really has that little exception for which there are three presidents against two presidents for the other, etc., etc. So you make it this kind of day-to-day -day work of lawyers and human rights lose the big kick and the fire they should have. And that's how I felt in the International Law Commission. And so when I came to the court, I was really very curious, how will the court deal with these issues? And my experience with regard to human rights conversations, etc., among members and in deliberations led me to say that the, the best thing that the ICJ can do would be to serve as some kind of an interface between human rights questions and questions of general international law, practical questions in which the ICJ well, maybe I shouldn't say that, but would work like a, a plumber. Of course, they plumber, plumber. The ICJ is a plumber. But if you have ever had a, a, some some water pipe breaking at your house and waiting for a plumber, you know that plumbers can be very important. So the ICJ can also be very important, right? So what I mean is somebody who will repair, who will say this cannot be done in that way. What you are saying in the human rights community about reservations to human rights treaties has to be kind of a cooled down a little bit. Uh, and I think in that regard, the International Court has really done, especially in very recent cases, a lot of good things also in the service of human rights. Maybe not everybody will agree that the, the most recent uh, judgment in that regard, namely the state immunity judgment between you know uh, Germany against Italy, belongs into that category. But I think it does because it showed the human rights community that there are certain rules where uh, uh, let's say, a generalist court like the International Court will simply not replace, uh, let's say, um, a careful state-of-the-art search for the law to be applied for, for, uh, for uh, wishful thinking. So also, this, this mainstreaming would also mean showing limits to certain progressive ideas which would uh, be, come up in the, in the human rights world.
But I think most of the things the International Court has done are very, let's say, beneficial to human rights. For instance, state responsibility. The International, law, uh, the international Court has developed, uh, has applied rules of attribution for human rights contexts. The International Court has applied, uh, let's say, the, the notion of positive obligations deriving from human rights in the genocide case by elaborating uh, on, for instance, the duty of, uh, of uh, prevention. Uh, in, in the Genocide Convention. The court has said interesting things about reservations to, I mean, actually has developed what you could call the modern law on reservations to multilateral treaties in its 1951 uh, advisory opinion and so on. So I think this would be something in which, which the court could really contribute and as you quoted, um, where no other, let's say, international judicial institution would be in the same good situation to do these things as the ICJ. That's what I mean by mainstreaming. Uh, would this also apply to other areas of international law, for example environmental law, where we don't have a general court on environmental matters? Um, I think the court will face a number of cases in which environmental matters will uh, play a very important role. I mean, you, for instance, there is going to be, uh, probably not, not next year, but like next year, there is going to be the case of uh, Ecuador against Colombia, in which Ecuador complains about uh, aerial herbicide spraying done by Colombia with, a, good fr with a, a bit of help from the good friends in the United States. Uh, herbicide spraying which has, which has uh, polluted the Ecuadorian environment, they say, and also has led to, to health problems. Uh, so this will be uh, a very interesting case. There is also a case about scientific whaling. Oh my God, Norway, this is Norway. So if the <laughs> whaling where the Japanese uh, uh, pretend that the, they really catch whales for uh, scientific purposes and of course you couldn't just let the whale meat rot so they eat it, right? I don't know. Uh, okay, I'm talking about a, a, a litigation instituted by Australia against Japan and as the name says it's scientific whaling so my guess is that I haven't read the, 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 the memorials yet uh, or at all. Um, that scientific, for instance, the problem of scientific evidence will play a good role. How does the court handle uh, scientific uh, expert evidence in its cases? So that is the, the, the little aspect of the general topic of ICJ in environment, uh, which was of the greatest interest to me because I thought that what the court has done until now with regard to scientific evidence is insufficient and the court does not really exhaust the potential it has you know, uh, in that regard because as you know the statute of the court uh, would give the court the opportunity to hire its own independent experts, court appointed experts, uh, which the court has only done in a, in a couple of cases in very relatively insignificant uh, circumstances until now. You know, like uh, Corfu Channel, where you had these, again, Navy ships, my great hobby, where you had, I think there was a Norwegian, I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't a Norwegian military person there who had to see whether from a certain point on the coast you could see if they would throwing mines into the water in the territorial sea of Albania, stuff like that. So I mean, things are, a bit, are getting a bit more complicated. And for me, the question is, will the court let's say, early enough catch up with the way certain international, other international courts are dealing with scientific evidence. For instance, I'm currently a member, and this is on the record, so I can say, I'm currently a member of an arbitral tribunal in a case between uh, Pakistan, brought by Pakistan against India, which has to do with the hydroelectric use of rivers that form the Indus. And the Indus, of course, is of just huge importance for the survival of Pakistan. Um, and there the uh, arbitration is on the basis of the Indus Water Treaty and the Indus Water Treaty provides for an arbitral tribunal of seven judges, seven arbitrators, but one of the arbitrators is, a, is supposed to be a hydrologist. And I've just come here more or less from The Hague where we had two weeks of uh, hearings in that case. And I have to say if we hadn't had that great uh, Professor Wheater, uh, a hydrologist from the UK now working in Canada, I don't know what the, 
whether all our decisions would have been as right as I think they were due to the ever present, let's say, the, the presence of an expert within your group. And not experts kind of led on a leash by the agents in cases in which the experts speak as counsel, which means there is no uh, possibility for any immediate examination or cross-examination, so, uh, which to me doesn't make much sense. Um, you already referred to, to the judgment in the pulp mills case mm -hmm. um, between Argentina and, and Uruguay, where the court rejected Argentina's claim that the toxic discharges from the pulp mill uh, that was constructed on the river Uruguay by Uruguay would change the ecological balance of the river. <clears throat> now, based on the scientific evidence, evidence submitted to the court, <coughs> the court was not convinced of the fact that the discharges actually caused harm to the river environment. And in your disoin, uh, dis, uh, joint dissenting opinion with Judge al Kasavni, you, you criticized the court <coughs> for having wasted a golden opportunity to demonstrate to the international community its ability and preparedness to approach scientifically complex dispute in a state-of-the-art manner. Um, your criticism is based on the failure of the court to call upon independent experts, as you just mentioned, um, that are uh, in, in a position to properly assess the highly complex and controversial scientific evidence provided by the experts, in this case acting as the counsels of the parties. Now, the reluctance of the court, <coughs> together with its traditional approach to the burden of proof, where it is the duty of the party which asserts certain facts to establish evidence of such facts, led, of course, to the situation that Argentina, uh, Argentina's evidence was not found to be convincing and, and Argentina lost the case. Now, as yourself said, disputes with complex scientific and technical aspects will become more and more common in, uh, as the world will be faced with both environmental and other complex challenges. You already elaborated on the role of the court uh, when faced with inconclusive and contradicting evidence in the absence of scientific certainty. If I understood you correctly, you, you suggest that maybe having a scientist on board, uh, calling on independent experts, uh, uh, may be a way to, to assess uh, uh, evidence. Yet it will still be difficult when we are faced with scientific uncertainty, where we really don't have the right answers, or where experts, scientific experts, cannot give us the answer to one particular question. Now, the Council for Argentina argued with a reversal of the burden of proof. <clears throat> based on the precautionary principle, meaning that the party attempting to carry out a potentially damaging activity, like building the pulp mills, um, needs to provide conclusive evidence that its activities will not cause harm. So that is really reversing the, the burden of proof. The, the court, of course, rejected this argument. There was not even a longer discussion, at least not from the judgment, to read about uh, a reversal of a burden of proof. But in your view, would a state-of-the-art manner, as you called for, to deal with scientific uncertainty in highly complex, highly complex environmental or other disputes, in particular where a preventative rather than a, a compensatory logic is required, demand a, re a reversal of burden of proof to the party wanting to carry out a damaging activity? What was your question? No, I mean, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's very, I mean, highly sophisticated, highly uh, difficult uh, questions, highly difficult to, to answer. Uh, as you rightly said, I remember the, the question, of course, was, in the, was deliberated by the court, uh, should we reverse uh, the burden of proof? And um, no, we are not going to do that. Um, <laughs> I think in environmental matters, the court has really, uh, if you look at the jurisprudence, and that of course could also be done by somebody from the outside, has shown a, a rather conservative uh, streak. Um, not just with regard to how to deal scientific evidence. I think if you look at the court, you can see that the guy who acted first and the guy who said, it, said something like a fait accompli has been... Uh, has been has gained something from that. Um, 
That is, for instance, shown in the way the ICJ handled the Argentinian request for a provisional measure uh, in the pulp mills case in 2006, I think, where they said, let, let, would, would, you, would, you, would you order Uruguay to suspend further, uh, let's say, construction of the pulp mills until, you have, until we, the court, has spoken about the merits. Um, and what happened was more or less the same thing that happened. So what I see, you know, as I said, I'm not speaking as a judge, I'm just speaking as, as an academic, is that the, the court then tells the, the state who has gone ahead, like the construction of a bridge over the Great Belt, or the construction of a, of a pulp mill on the Uruguay River says, but you, you're going to, all right, I mean, I'll, you're, you, have to, you have to see that you're going to continue at your own risk. And it cannot really be excluded that uh, when in, on the merits you lose, you might be forced to kind of uh, tear down the bridge or whatever. And I have, I don't know, it probably, the reason is I come from the Vorarlberg where people are considered to be extremely pragmatic and realistic and worldly, that I simply cannot believe an international court to, to uh, if you look at the Great Belt case, you know, just, I, I really want to see the international court who, uh, years after such a provisional measures was refused and where a billion dollars or uh, euros have uh, been invested in a project to tell, well, unfortunately, you're going to lose on the merits and would you please dismantle the beautiful bridge or the beautiful pulp mills. Uh, and that's why, again, why I like the Pakistan-India uh, arbitration so much, because there, last September, my arbitral tribunal came out with a provisional measure, which for the first time, as far as I can see, it is said, there is a danger that if you continue, we are going to tell you on the merits that you shouldn't, it would, it, what you did was illegal, and therefore we order you not to continue. We order you not to continue. I think this was a quite courageous thing to do. Uh, again, maybe uh, one of the reasons why we said it was the, the presence of an independent expert among, among the lawyers. Uh, so, um, back to the ICJ. <laughs> My impression is that also in the few judgments that you have on the matter, there might be a beautiful, let's say, a beautiful, a few beautiful words said about progressive ideas like uh, precautionary principles, sustainable development, and all that stuff. But uh, don't they don't they look to you as if they were simply can put, you know, like you say, uh, I look at a, a birthday cake and say, come on, let's <laughs> a little bit here and there, or a southern German Baroque or Rococo church, you know, full of little things. That, uh, what I mean is a bit of uh, things that are added so a judgment looks better. But the, when you look at the gist of the judgments, it's really very, let's say, very conservative, very conservative unprogressive judgments as far as we are now. Let's see whether something changes in the coming years. I've heard, I've heard that, that the court for the uh, Ecuador-Colombia uh, case will uh, at least um, have a, a deliberation uh, about whether they want to hire their own experts. And I think that would be a very good idea. So there might be, uh, there might be a, a slow change, but everything in a court, of course, all the changes are very gradual and very, very hesitating. And in, in this particular case, the aerial herbicide spraying case, um, the court is given an opportunity to advance the law um, by adjudicating on the substantive requirements of the principle of prohibition of transboundary harm and also on the work of the International Law Commission, namely the 2001 draft articles on prevention of transboundary harm from hazardous activities, or maybe even elevating them to the status of customary law. How do you see the chances, chances of judicial interpretation and meaningful application of the no harm principle, the pro prohibition of transboundary harm, in this case by the court? Well, I think if, if I had to tell you uh, in which area of environmental law 
some progressive, let's say, findings could be expected on the part of the court. I would say in a transfrontier, transfrontier pollution context, that's probably where the court would, would go farther than in a context where uh, damage to the environment or uh, uh, degradation of the environment plays in a, let's say, in a multilateral uh, context like uh, climate change. Uh, where the only thing I can think of with regard to the ICJ and climate change, just in, in case you were going to ask me that question, I would kind of uh, do a prevent, a, a pre not no, the American, a preemptive attack uh, on you and say, please keep everything which has to do with climate change and uh, global warming away from the ICJ. It is not the right organ. I think the area, it is, it's not, it's not ripe yet, the problem, uh, I consider the problem not ripe yet, at least for the international courts, which I know a little bit. And maybe what, what would come out would be um, a contribution to the, to, uh, to the stopping or, uh, of development of the law in that regard. So don't take certain issues of the law to the court uh, too early. There is indeed uh, a fear both amongst scholars and, and also negotiator uh, if this case would come or the advisory opinion would be, would be asked. Uh, Just to, to explain, I think what you were uh, dealing with, what you meant was that there is a, there seems to be a movement in the UN by Palau, Palau yes. who uh, wants to, uh, let's say, um, work towards the, the General Assembly asking the ICJ for an advisory opinion on whether what would the question be? You know more about this than um, it just that the, it is a violation that states violate international law by not doing enough against... Yeah, the, the question is not defined yet, but it's whether other states and other nations can be held accountable for environmental damage to their territory caused by climate change. So they seek uh, an advisory opinion on the responsibilities of states under international, uh, under international law to ensure that activities carried out under their jurisdiction or control that emit greenhouse gases do not do damage to other mm -hmm. states. So it's a uh, broader application of the prohibition on trans, uh, transboundary harm. Of course, I could imagine some of my colleagues saying, mm -hmm. what do you mean by accountability? That's not a, a term we have encountered in the Peace Palace. Do you mean, and what do you mean by responsibility? We are dealing with state responsibility as codified in the International Law Commission's articles and, and, and if you apply this stuff to that question then you would probably agree with me that you better don't do that, mm. you shouldn't do it. Mm. No, I, I, I do agree with you and as I said this, this view is shared by many um, academics but also by the negotiators that, that uh, try to find a political and finally a legal solution to, to the issue of, uh, of climate change. Um, uh, final question with regard to environmental matters. The ICJ established... Professor Boyd's a, favorite. Yes, uh, <laughs> that's I the final and question and we'll <laughs> turn to something else. But I always wondered what happened to the Chamber on Environmental Matters. It was established in 1996, I think, and it, it existed for 30, 13 years, but it was never, ever used. Wh why wasn't it used? So just to explain, the, the statute of the ICJ provides for a number of chambers for different matters. These chambers, the, the ones that were provided in the statute, have never played any role, if I am correct. Then there was a, uh, in, the, in the 70s, when the court had very little business to do, they wanted to make the court a bit more, let's say, acceptable to countries, and so they, the, in the, not in the statute of the court, but in the rules of court, uh, the, the, uh, there is a, a provision under which states can come to the court and say, we don't want all 15, uh, we want a chamber to decide the case, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and then uh, at some stage, I don't even when, the idea was, let's have a chamber, an environmental chamber. Actually, I was for a number of years elected to that environmental chamber. But the good news for you is that the reason why it was never used and the reason why, I think they, they didn't kill it, they, it just leave it, it, as far as I know, it hasn't been, let's say, eliminated, it's still there. But the reason is that we had the feeling, also from the few cases in which environmental law played a role, that uh, the rule is that if states come to the ICJ, 
um, and it is not a border question between Benin and Niger or something, uh, something really, really bilateralist and nothing bi bilateralist. They want the court. If you go to the court, huge expense, risk of loss, you want at least the whole court to decide and not five, five, five people from among the judges. So I think the, the reason is uh, rather flattering for the, let's say, uh, respect for environmental law. So the, the feeling is such cases, important cases, cases dealing with important questions should be dealt with by the whole court. That's what gives the ICJ decisions its particular weight. It's not five, it's not three, it's 15 or 16 or 17. Thank you. Um, from one controversial matter, environment, to yet another one, to the prohibition on the use of force. Professor Zimmer, in your foreword to the book Customary International Law and the Use of Force, you write, published in 2005, you write, in the wake of September 11, one of the cornerstones of contemporary international law, the containment of military force set up in the United Nations Charter, is being threatened in its very existence like never before in the 60 years since its inception. Of course, the history of this charter prohibition has always been replete with flagrant breaches and lame excuses, but what we have uh, been witnessing in recent years goes far beyond the familiar scenario of exercises of armed force accompanied by more or less persuasive attempts at justifying them as acts of self-defense. Rather, what we are facing today is an even more open challenge to the very raison d'etre and continued desirability of the charter system in favor of uninhibited employment of military might by the privileged few. This development started with the NATO airstrikes in the Kosovo crisis, continued with the war in Afghanistan and culminated in the invasion of Iraq. While with a heavy dose of goodwill, the first two instances can be viewed as still remaining somehow close to international legality, the Iraq war presents itself as a depressing and probably hitherto unparalleled case of open floating of the prohibition of the use of force with a series of changing justifications proclaimed both before and after the breach, adding insult to injury. Now, the world is still turning around its axis and things have happened since 2005. How do you see the development since 2005? Do you see a change to the better, or to the worse, regarding breach of the rule banning the use of force in international law, in particular with regard to the NATO bombings in Libya based on Security Council Resolution 1973, authorizing member states to take all necessary measures to protect civilians under attack? Two parts of an answer to that question. The first part is again a bit personal because you might have listened to that, uh, let's say, state uh, quotation and uh, it, is, it doesn't really read like an excerpt uh, from a judgment of the ICJ. What I want to say by this is that um, if you are an academic, I mean, my acad I, I like to be an academic and I like to write, but I like to write academic stuff because you are free to say what you want in a way which shouldn't, of course, be, let's say, uh, too aggressive, but in a way you, you like, which means you like nice expressions, you like subtleties, maybe you like some, you know, some deliberate ambiguities, a bit of humor, slightly cynical remarks, all the, the things that make writing interesting and nice to me. Then you come to the court and you have to forget everything. You have to learn the bland style, you know, like just simple things. Uh, for an academic writer, I don't know, Robert, whether you would uh, agree that don't use the same verb always, all the time, you know, so just kind of modulate a bit. Of course, in the court, if you modulate the verb, states might get the idea that, that the court means something different, but not always say put, put, put 
you know. So, okay, so would you please? And I remember my first experience in a drafting committee. Uh, I drafted, I was proud on it, and then came the, uh, actually a great lawyer, Santiago Villapando, who is now in New York, and I said, said ah, Monsieur Le Juge said, excellence, but you know, the court style is a bit different, would you? I said, yeah, write it your way, okay. And he did that three or four times at the end, I wouldn't have recognized my own text anymore, because now it had that really, that kind of turgid blend uh, stuff. Um, so what you pine for is a good occasion for a separate or dissenting opinion or writing a foreword to a colleague's book, as I did here, because there you can let go, you know. You don't, you don't have that muzzle that you wear as a judge when writing and speaking as a judge. So that explains the language that you have here. Still back on the substance, while Kosovo, you, you talked about thin red line, venial sin, it was still on the substance. Yeah, you have reality. to be a Catholic to understand all that. I don't know how many Catholics there are in the, in the audience in mortal sins versus venial sins and all that stuff. Kosovo was a venial sin, venial sin. in your words. Which is um, less. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, how do you see the development since um, well, Libya? I mean, I think that I think that the great ex okay Kosovo was a case. You said. I remember. I remember the the, the fall of. Uh, Uh, 2000, let me see, 9-11, 2001, right? Mm -hmm. With regard to Af um, Afghanistan. Uh, and there, I think, um, you could, as a lawyer, you could really argue, or you could have argued in, in good faith, etc., that what happened with regard to Afghanistan was in accordance with the law. Uh, then came Iraq, which is the absolute abyss, I would say, and a, a huge, a really, violation of international law. Just think of the follow-up in, in the United Kingdom now, where you have these commissions. You had a commission in, in Holland, which came to the, to the to result that, uh, that the um, involvement of the Dutch or participation of, of the Netherlands it was against uh, the law. In, uh, you, have, um, you have the great, um, let's say, inquisition in the United Kingdom, on which Rosalind Higgins is right now writing the legal, let's say, report, which came to the conclusion that uh, that uh, the um, there was uh, it was an illegal activity so i i i think i see without being too optimist optimist a, a slow return to uh, greater let's say respect for 24 unfortunately not for reasons of respect for the law but maybe for reasons of the let's say uh, awful results of the activities undertaken in breach of international law. That's um, Before, I would like to turn the word to the audience because I would like to give a chance to ask mm. you some questions to, to our audience. One last question on the use of force. Um, the, the developments since 2000, in, in it, uh, since 2001 uh, to 2005, and you wrote your, your piece and ever since, um, What consequences do these developments have for the responsibility to protect? Do you see a strengthening of this concept or rather a, a criti criticism and, and weakening of it? Well, my impression was, I mean, um, let me say that contrary to some people in the audience whom I know, I'm not a great fan of the term responsibility to protect. Um, especially looking at the history of the concept. The history as I see it was that you had, you had the Kosovo intervention, in the aftermath you had this Canadian, uh, let's say, um, research project coming up, and I think in the, I don't know when precisely it was, might have been 2001, right, in the report of that Canadian sponsored uh, uh, commission, the term came up for the first time, I don't know, of course, Success has many fathers, and I've come across other names also coining for the first time the term responsibility to protect. I think it is, if you look at the United Nations, uh, let's say, uh, discussions and uh, outcomes of these discussions, you see there is a lot of uh, interesting and uh, good stuff to be found there. But as soon as the documents or the discussions reach the 
I should say, the Kosovo aspects of responsibility to protect, I do not see any, any greater, let's say, uh, affection for humanitarian intervention than before. And I don't blame the UN for that, because out of the 192 members of the United Nations, I don't know, probably 187 or so will find themselves at the receiving end of these blessings. So uh, I would also hesitate to vote for, a, let's say, a great opening. But of course, the idea of responsibility to protect that uh, it is, in the first instance, a country's own government which is responsible for the protection of its own population. And if that government is unwilling or unable to do so, then there is a responsibility on the part of the international community, that's fine. As long as the international community acts through the United Nations and action is taken on the basis of Chapter 7. On the other hand, I'm not a great fan of the security. Well, no, I should be more careful. I'm not. I'm not somebody for whom the the Security Council is like uh, the Holy Trinity or the the Holy Grail. Uh, the Security Council to me is 15 governments, five of them being there all the time, uh, and most of what they do is done on the basis of political considerations and not always carried by respect for international law. But still, I think um, requiring a, um, an authorization on the basis of Chapter 7, at least to me, secures a certain degree of, uh, let me call it, objectivity. Because if you, uh, if you have 15 countries with 15 different, uh, let's say, political interests, what comes out of that brewing is probably something that you might be objective, at least in the sense that it is not one big guy's interest which will prevail, at least to a degree, to a degree. And that's why I am politically speaking, of course, I can pray you all the law, you know, chapter 7, etc. But politically speaking, the attaching, the condition of a, a UN authorization makes eminent political sense also. So in that regard, uh, responsibility to protect is fine. But I think some people use it just uh, you know, it's a bit, you do awful things, but you want to find a good term, you know, humanitarian intervention, surgical strikes, you know, give it a, give it a medical touch, you know, I'm, I'm doing good to you, you don't feel it, you're going to lose your arm or your half of your population, but it was surgical, you know. And, and, and with some people, I, I feel a bit of the same. I like the idea of responsibility to protect because uh, it couches something which I, not you, are, are willing and able to do into this nice term. It's like politicians. Yes, I carry the responsibility on my shoulders. I, I, I don't leave my job, you know, but I can take a lot of responsibility on my shoulders. Okay, thank you very much. I do have one or two questions which I will leave to the very end, but I would like to invite the audience now to take the opportunity and ask some questions. I do have, where's Elizabeth to ask me, help me with the... Thank you very much. Uh, um, it was a very informative uh, speech. I we really enjoyed it. I, I really, I'm very honored to to be here. Uh, you said that there are some concepts uh, that could be very dangerous, so like for example the, uh, the uh, legitimate defense or uh, responsibility to protect could be interpreted the uh, other way, and you have seen the damage that that has made in the, in the recent history. But the third uh, concept is the jur universal jurisdiction also is going to be problematic in the international law because, for example, Spain held the Iraqi government responsibly, responsible for an attack to the Iranian opposition group in Iraq. And they have sent the, the arrest warrant against some of the uh, military people in Iraq. And uh, as far as I know, uh, two, three more countries in, in Europe also, uh, I think it is uh, Netherlands or, or Greece also, they have joined this uh, universal jurisdiction. And in Sweden, there is a, a discussion about it. My friend is uh, the head of this in the University of uh, Stockholm, told me that there is a, there is a discussion 
um, which could lead also that Sweden join this. What do you think about this uh, concept of uh, universal jurisdiction? Thank you. Before you answer, could you please identify yourself when you ask? Uh, sorry, my name is Paris Kasai. So um, I, I think I had a problem of understanding just acoustically because of the microphone. So I think it's about universal jurisdiction, what my view would be of universal jurisdiction. Um, mm, mm. Well, we, if I start, the court has really been, uh, let's say, um, dodging the question of universal jurisdiction in one very well-known case, which was the arrest warrant or the Erodia case decided in 2002. Um, but um, I think the parties, there was some kind of agreement that uh, the question would not be, uh, let's say that the, the, the claimant did not really raise the question and did not insist on having the court dealing with that issue. Um, I'm not an international criminal lawyer. I'm not a. Um, um, <laughs> the exper What I see is that domestic judges, except the name is Garcon, do not really jump at the opportunity to apply dom uh, universal jurisdiction. Uh, there are some German court decisions which actually applied the principle. Um, I think it is a, a good principle. I think it is, if it is really uh, applied as in the way it should, as an absolutely residual principle, if no other, uh, let's say, state is closer to the case and could, um, and, and, and also acts. For instance, just to, I don't know whether this is precisely with regard to universal jurisdiction, but I find the case which, have, which was decided by the International Court of Justice just a few weeks ago, uh, the case uh, Belgium that Belgium brought against Senegal, I think of a good example because I think the, the reason why Belgium took Senegal to court for the laxness of uh, prosecuting or ex residually extraditing uh, Nissan Habre to uh, uh, was because Belgian juge d'instruction had been had uh, gotten to do with the cases, and I think the the relationship the the re I know that some of the individuals whose cases were brought before the Belgian uh, let's say uh, judges there was some relationship with Chad in the sense that these people had at the time their human rights were violated, being Chadian nationals, had probably been uh, fled to Belgium, gotten political asylum there and later uh, acquired a Belgian citizenship. So there is, a, in, in the case, in the relationship between Belgium and Nissan Habre, there's a bit of that established uh, touch of, uh, let's say, diplomatic protection. But, uh, but uh, the, the, the element of diplomatic protection wasn't really pursued with any vigor by Belgium in the case. So it was really the, the Belgian claim that this is, we are states parties to one and the same convention, that is the UN Anti-Torture Convention, uh, which means that every state is obligated vis-a-vis -vis any other state party to that convention to prosecute or extradite. And I think um, I see the, universe, the principle of universal jurisdiction built into that treaty in a way which I find very, very, very good. But as I said, I'm not a great expert on international criminal law and probably not able to really go into the nooks and crannies of that, of that principle. Right. The first row. Yes, um, thanks very much for a very interesting conversation and, uh, and very rich uh, conversation. Uh, to, to follow up on, uh, on the use of force, uh, you said that uh, you understood that uh, uh, UN member states would not uh, like to, to claim that uh, there is a right of uh, humanitarian intervention. But uh, as uh, an academic and your advice to other academics, what would you advise? Would you advise that, uh, that uh, there is no right to humanitarian intervention in any case? That there is a right, there should be a right, or, uh, or that uh, in some cases humanitarian intervention is legitimate but not 
legal. So, so what is your opinion about that? Um, another question is about um, uh, the experiences from uh, the intervention in Libya. And uh, there there was a UN mandate, but afterwards there was a discussion about uh, whether the mandate had been uh, uh, violated and whether the Allied had uh, gone too far. And it seems to me that uh, there might be a dilemma between uh, adopting a mandate and then uh, controlling the implementation. So is there a need for some mechanism to control the implementation of what the Security Council has authorized? To start with your second question, um I think we probably agree, I read from you the, the, your question that you have a problem with the way uh, the, the states acting by military means in Libya uh, imp uh, implement the resolution was correct and I fully agree with that. I think the, the um, uh, what is it, seven, 17 something, I don't know the, so the uh, I, my impression is, well not the impression, I mean my view is that the, the way the, uh, that resolution was implemented was a misconstruction and misinterpretation. Uh, it went beyond the, uh, it went beyond the, the limit uh, and uh, explains why the countries that in the case of Libya were finally brought to agree to that resolution are not to, and it gives one of the reasons why these two permanent members of the Security Council uh, are not going to give the same green light in the Syria case. So I think it was, uh, it was a, an abuse of a Security Council mandate. Now there's Oh, that's the first question. Uh, yes, uh, the how would I academically, you know, academically? Well, academically, mm, academically, I would probably take the view which uh, Jan Brownlee has taken a long, long time ago uh, to the matter in a in a paper which I think had the title "Some Thoughts on Kind-Hearted Gunmen," which I like very much. Some thoughts on kind-hearted gunmen. Uh, and I think the idea which he uh, developed in this paper and some other was that um, it's a bit the euthanasia model. That is, uh, there are things that might be legally prohibited, but of course the, the, the intensity with which they, their breach will be, um, will be uh, followed or uh, sanctions will follow will vary very much. So I think the, the, most, uh, the, the more beneficial way of looking at things would be to regard humanitarian intervention, we know what we mean by that, as something not admitted, so that it's, not, that it's not legal, um, it cannot be justified, but uh, when you look also at the state practice, all cases from Stanleyville 1964 through Entebbe up to what we have now, there, there were very different degrees of condemnation by the international community. And in some instances, quite a bit of understanding for a state which did, which a thing that legally it should not have done under the specific circumstances. But my my uh, advice would be to keep to keep the prohibition, and then let's uh, then talk about alleged breaches on a case by case basis. Thank you. I think we continue with the gentleman in the second row, but I would really like to encourage the students here today to seize the opportunity to ask some questions. Hello, I'm Fardin from Iran. I have here for my vacation, but uh, meanwhile uh, uh, I am uh, well, an applicant for PhD and pursuing. I'm, I like to uh, pursue my study here in Oslo University. It is my honor to attending here in your conference. Uh, it is my pleasure. Uh, my question is about lease pendants. Lease pendants. What? Lease pendants. Oh, lease pendants. Sorry, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's going to be technical. Do not uh, yes. pronounce it well. Uh, ex excuse me. Uh, as far as uh, we know, uh, in Lockerbie case, in Lockerbie case, the U.S. and uh, Libya uh, went to the uh, Security Council and uh, the court, uh, respectively. Uh, as far as we know, uh, in the, according to the Charter of the United Nations, the 
uh, when it, when the Security Council is uh, is, refer, is referring and doing its job, uh, the General Assembly do not uh, do, um, should not uh, taking part in the case. Uh, so uh, in Lockerbie, in Lockerbie, uh, Libya and uh, and the United States uh, uh, was dissenting about uh, about their uh, their solution. Each went to, to the uh, uh, to the one to the council and another to the court. Uh, what is the mechanism of the court for uh, for as far as there is not a clear rule for uh, for separating uh, judicial and political problems? Uh, how uh, how the court uh, uh, usually usually separate uh, the problems and uh, do, for do, do, for in, uh, for uh, uh, do, do not uh, taking part taking part in the security council uh, 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 responsibilities. Thank you very much. Um, this is a very difficult question, and uh, I think the 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 people in charge should be very much thanked for having solved the Lockerbie problem in Scotland, in Holland, or wherever, uh, in ways that kept the court from having decide in the further stages of the case. I mean, the, the ICJ uh, was requested in the first stage to uh, decree or to have a, or to do a preliminary measure, which the court refused to do. And uh, but when you when you think of the next discussion, the next decision in the Lockerbie case, the court uh, said that it did not lack jurisdiction on the case. But then, fortunately, the court uh, did not have to deal with the case further, and it ended up in some other in some other quarters. Um, I think cases, of course, the the relationship between the ICJ and the Security Council can have. Uh, can have different forms. For instance, there was such a question also in the in the wall opinion, in, in the wall advisory opinion of 2004. Um, I think the the rule of the thumb for the ICJ would be, um, if it's a matter, if it's just a matter of the Security Council dealing with a matter, this does not automatically preclude us from taking up the same matter. We are, not the we are not the General Assembly, which according to Article 12, I think, has to step aside as long as the Security Council really deals with the matter as it should. So I think there are a number of statements by the ICJ, that is the GNC 1976 and further cases, where the court has said expressly the fact that the Security Council is uh, dealing with the same matter does not preclude us from taking the case in our hand too. But I think the, the, the image behind is that uh, Security Council and ICJ would work side by side and in, in a way mutually reinforce each other. Whereas the case, of course, the Lockerbie case would have gotten the ICJ in a situation where the ICJ was used by Libya to, uh, to counter as a counterforce to the, to the Security Council. And as I said, from my own experience, I think the, it, it was a very good idea not to pursue it further in the ICJ. Uh, I mean, I, I, there, there were writers like Tom Frank, etc., when at the time of Lockerbie said this is a, what my great friend, uh, well, uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter would call a constitutional moment, you know. Uh, a constitutional moment for the ICJ, Madison versus, what is that case, Marbury versus Madison. I've never studied in the US. But see, when the Supreme Court apparently established itself as a constitutional court, uh, may, may the ICJ be spared such an opportunity. Thank you. Um, I saw Professor Robert Cope raising his hand. Still, students? Yeah, Robert Cole, just a very short question, and you may answer very shortly. In your eyes, three reforms which would improve the work at the court without implying the change of the statute. Apart from expert nomination, what would you see as something which could help improve the work without? modifying the statute. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Very good question. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can think of three. <laughs> the, the one thing that comes to my mind uh, instantly is that um, I would uh, I would eliminate the possibility of re-election of judges. I would uh, uh, provide for a 12-year, uh, uh, let's say, uh, term. And as I said, no possibility for re-election. I think this... Uh, uh, I would say the more heterogeneous the sociological substratum of a court is, the more sense such a rule makes. I mean, we also have it in Germany with the Federal Constitutional Court, and of course it also makes sense there. Uh, I think it would be beneficial for the court if uh, some members were spared the, the effort to, towards the end of their mandate, to somehow show that uh, they have been active judges and they have done a lot of work or maybe even to show the, where, where their sympathies lie. This is something which I consider uh, not good and therefore I think you should have your term uh, and maybe the, the courage of judges to speak up a bit more would be furthered by knowing after 12 years it's out. So that would be number one. So this one came easy. The second one... Sorry? Sorry? It's a positive modification. A positive? No, I mean... Without modification. Oh, without modification of the statute. Improvement. Uh, another, uh, let's say, something w it has to do with, my, with the way I felt up on the bench. I don't know if you've ever made the experience... Yeah, of course, as students, you are exposed to that experience all the time, which means you have to sit and listen to somebody speaking bad English, French, Spanish, uh, uh, English and French in New York. And of course you can move around or laugh or even leave. But if you're up on the bench uh, and you have to suffer through uh, nine weeks of oral hearings, as the court did in, in the uh, genocide case, um, I was co-agent and counsel for Germany in a case and, and, and counsel for uh, Cameroon in another case. So I knew when I came to the court that you can tell what judges do up there on the bench. For instance, I could tell as somebody sitting down there or speaking in front of the court whether Judge X was writing, taking notes or just drawing a, um, a carpet uh, design as some of the judges, uh, no names, like to do. Um, this standing jokes among the judges was uh, not even a joke. It was a serious joke. Uh, what 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 do you do, uh, Bruno, when um, when you feel you are just dozing off? I had a neighboring judge tell me, uh, "Would you please, so kind, and take your pen and just hit my." legs so that I wake up. So it is terrible. It is also terrible because in 90% of the time uh, uh, counsel read fa prefabricated material. So, uh, if you have done your homework as a judge and have read the 900 pages of written stuff which you are supposed to read beforehand and then verbating for hours and days the same thing is put before you again, it is hard. So what I would uh, suggest like to have is a maybe not the US Supreme Court style uh, legal uh, discourse, you know, where you, but I mean, don't we have sovereign states appearing in Luxembourg? Don't we have sovereign states appearing in Strasbourg? In Strasbourg, I think they get what do they get? 20 minutes or something, and then and then it's up for questions. So why shouldn't the ICJ? So the reason that you get is, you know. It's a bit like Hans Kelsen's definition of customer international law. States should behave as they have always behaved. Courts should behave as they have always behaved. And it's not just a should, it's a very convenient, comfortable, yes, yes, we love to do, we love to do things as we have always done it. And we have done that since 1923, you know. And it's, so what I want to say is that it's very, very difficult to get the court even to make little moves in things like that, just because it's so ingrained, and in a way also because it's so comfortable. For the, the other side, you know, the, 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 the state's parties. But of course you don't want to discourage, you want, you want countries to appear, you want the legal advisors acting as agents to feel good in front of the court. You don't want to kind of... Uh, uh, Okay, number two, a third one. Maybe I can think of a third. 
Okay, the, the legal expert would be the number three. Um, the student, I just wanted to find out if the act of aggression could be seen as a crime against humanity at one point. And then the second question is, I seek your comment on terrorism as a crime, if it gets to be, and where it would be tried. Thank you. Um, the first question was act of aggression as an international crime. Of course, that leads us right into from Oslo to Kampala. Uh, and again, I have to say I'm not a great expert on international criminal law, but of course, the statute of the ICC has that aggression as a crime. And so I think it was a good idea to, uh, let's say, get the or the work towards implementation as happened in Kampala. Um, let us see how this will be applied in practice. I wish the ICC every luck it deserves, but I think you will have to agree that it has had a hard time, and I guess once it starts implementing and realizing what Kampala, uh, let's say, brought, it, will, it might get into even harder times. But that has to do with uh, what some people, like uh, what an American colleague of mine might regard as the, the birth defect of the ICC, in which for the like-minded countries, among which I'm sure Norway and, and Germany account as the, the most important thing about the ICC, that the working of the ICC and the, the success should not depend on Security Council, uh, let's say, authorization, Security Council, that the, this should be a real court, not subjected to some kind of political control or political, let's say, um, pre, let's say motives qua a Security Council. So that's my uh, answer to your first question. What was the torture? Uh, uh, torture or uh, terrorism? terrorism? I'm sorry, terrorism. Let me, let me take this question as a little, uh, as an opportunity to say something, namely that I, what I as, a, as an academic found very problematic, especially in the jurisprudence of ICTY and other courts, and that gets me to terrorism, to the, to the, to the, to the acceptance of a customary law preventing terrorism by the, uh, again, uh, Nino Cassese. So he must, he must have written that in the um, Lebanon court about, what is it, one or two years ago. That is, the way in which some of these courts arrive at the conclusion that something they need and they want, and they want very much, is customary law, is to me highly problematic from a state-of-the-art application of any theory of customary law. We have time. You know, I mean, you have the United Nations, who has for decades worked for, I don't know, for, what is it, one and a half, at least dozens of conventions uh, against terrorism, who has worked and shed a lot of sweat over a general convention against terrorism. And then comes, uh, comes a, an international court and, and declares that, uh, let's say, terrorism is now an international crime and that international crime looks like this and that. That, to me, is very problematic. We um, have time for two brief questions. They're the final questions. And uh, I'd like to ask Storle Eskeland up in the fourth row and uh, Eirik in the front row to ask their questions together and then you may answer these two questions collectively. For, uh, Bruno Sima, it's been a pleasure to, to listen to you and to be, be a participant in this uh, discussion. You started out uh, with uh, reflecting on being an academic uh, uh, where, where you felt free and when you came to the court you felt limited in, in uh, different ways. It's easy to understand that from a, a sociological point of view, but when it comes to the law, what is the law? What are the rights and duties of uh, the, state, the states in the world? Uh, you must, as I, that's at least my opinion, you must uh, tell the world what, what the law is according to your opinion, whether you are an academic or a judge. Of course, as an academic you can uh, be more free in the way you phrase your opinions than you can 
can be as a judge. But in the end, there is one law. And, uh, and we cannot cover ourselves behind our roles. So I want to, to, uh, to, to challenge you to elaborate li a little bit about the dilemma, because I, I, it must be a dilemma uh, when you act sometimes as an academic and sometimes as a judge. May I, ask the, may I answer this question, Sepp, because I think it will go under in a way if uh, further questions it's follow, etc. Um, of course, very much will depend uh, what you do as an academic and what you do as a, as a judge. I mean, as an academic, uh, if I think of my own writing, I think you, you mentioned the, the first book I ever wrote, which was the, the, uh, the reciprocity in the formation of customer international law. This wasn't really about what the law says or what the law prohibits or allows. It was just a very, let's say, early, immature, uh, let's say, theory of how I thought custom, the, recip the role that reciprocity played. I wrote my second book about <laughs> the role of reciprocity in the formation of treaties, so I'm a bit, uh, fixated in that regard sociologically, you would say, or psychologically. So again, very little in that book is, uh, you know, the law says X, you must not do this or that. Um, so I think as an academic, of course, maybe if I think of what I have written, self-contained regimes, okay? So, you know, or, or erga omnes or community, most of our descriptions of movements, etc., and not, uh, not what a judge has to say or write up on, on the bench you were allowed to do that, or this is illegal or uh, illegal. You see what I mean? So uh, that explains a bit the difference I see in the, different, in the roles, because probably very, very little in my academic writing has been to the effect something that state X dead was, was illegal or... And if I wrote about, like, like uh, uh, the Kosovo, I used all these Catholic uh, doctrines of venial sins versus mortal sins, which as a judge, done from the bench wouldn't sound that great uh, because you don't have only to do with Catholics at the Hague, you know, you would have to translate it into the very religions and I found a very interesting discussion I had in New York in the UN United Nations Association of the, with people like the current uh, Soviet uh, foreign, uh, Russian foreign minister and a few counterparts from other countries where they really said uh, this is a typically Catholic view on humanitarian intervention, a typically Protestant view, which, which was very amusing in a sense. So you can if you want. Um, but of course, as a judge, you, 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 speak, uh, you speak the law. And, uh, and my short answer would then be if, and there, of course, you are totally right. In academic writing or as a judge, you would have to say the same thing. What do you believe? What, what is the result you have arrived at in a state of the art way of what the law allows or does not allow? Thank you. And one final question. Brevity is of the issue here. They are legal advices. Now, there are legal advices and there are legal advices. Some are very good. Sorry, legal advices. Legal writers. Uh, legal yes. advices. Oh, advisors. To ministries of Foreign Affairs. Exactly. And um, some of them are very good, of course, but some of them are very bad losers. You mentioned how in 1973 you had a conversation with counsel for Austria who had just lost a case before the European Commission on Human Rights and that man was very unhappy, in fact very cross and said that had we known what we today know about how this instrument would be interpreted we would not have acceded to it. Now one can give many examples of how during the last five decades legal advisers after having lost their cases have been just as unhappy as your Austrian colleague in the 1970s during the Ireland and United Kingdom case on torture and um, degrading and inhuman treatment um, when Torke Lopsal from this university um, had been in the commission had said that the UK had in fact breached Article 3, had committed torture. The reaction of the UK um, legal counsel was why does this man hate England? Mm. And so they can be very bad losers. And I'm just wondering whether we ought, in fact, to base our analyses of public international law uh, to such an extent of, um, on 
the appraisals by legal advisors when they have just lost their cases, or whether, in fact, we should counsel some caution in that regard. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Interesting question. Would you please leave? No, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, well, I think not just with regard to legal advisors, any commentators, I think it would always be a gear to at least sleep over a night or let a let little time pass and then maybe the, a bit of the excitement will, will evaporate. For instance, uh, since you mentioned the UK government, I remember uh, a couple of instances where the European Court of Human Rights came out with a case um, and the, what you could read in the papers was uh, just uh, fuming I don't know whether it was the legal advisors, probably more the politicians, saying this is awful, we are never going to do that, etc., etc. And of course they did it afterwards, so it's just... Uh, um, I remember the reaction of the US legal advisor, a fine gentleman, uh, Taft, uh, senior Roman III or some, a very complicated name, but a, a very fine man, who wrote in the Yale uh, Journal of International Law, gave his reactions that there is a number of statements in their judgment with which the United States uh, cannot agree on military matters, etc., etc. So there are these reactions, but I think most of them are very, let's say, how should I say, uh, uh, moderate and uh, thoughtful. And uh, even though, of course, yeah, I think that that's what I want to say, I think. Don't take their first reactions as uh, uh, as the the reaction of the country concerned about the matter. Even though I highly admire the lady whose name I don't have present, who decided to leave the UK Foreign Office, uh, will Will yeah. Hurst. Will uh, Will Will Hurst. Something. Something that there was one. There was one member of the the legal the team of lawyers in the UK Foreign Office who actually left her job um, when uh, the UK finally uh, had to arrive at the conclusion that uh, participation in the Iraq uh, invasion was was legal. The better view that it was legal. I have high admiration for that for her. But of course, very much will depend whether, you know, I mean, what is your situation, etc. Thank you. We are closing in on the end of this very interesting interview. Let me allow two more questions. One question, very briefly, could you identify for us three fields or three questions of international law where research efforts are urgently needed? <laughs> <laughs> or two. <laughs> uh, urgently needed. Where are academics mm -hmm. need? Mm. <laughs> well, I'm I'm afraid that my non-jump at an answer might indicate that international judges don't really read much of the stuff that people like you are writing. <laughs> Uh, and there might be a little <laughs> truth to that, just for matters, because you're always in a, you're, it's always urgent and you have very little time. But I think in uh, the, like, um, sustainable development, precautionary principle, I'd love to see them uh, presented in a way that practice will take them up and not just give some kind of a, a lip service to them and otherwise just act in the same cold way as it has done. Um, God, another topic. Please continue writing. I think it is simply impossible for me to sort out one topic as more important because that might discourage people who write about other topics. <laughs> Thank you very much. I take the sustainable development and precautionary principle issues home with me and hopefully some of the students. Final question. May I ask you a question about legal education? Given the impact of globalization in almost every facet of our life, how important do you think is it for law schools to offer modern law teaching, broadening the perspective from a traditionally very strong national focus to incorporating, let's say, comparative, bilingual, multisystemic, pluralistic approaches, what have you, just opening, modernizing how uh, law students are being taught? Maybe you have some experiences from Michigan or from Siena or even the Hague Academy where you could give us some interesting 
innovative advice on how to teach international well let me let me i could answer it in the following way i could say now i have retired from the court i have been retired retiring from the university a long time ago that is i'm now an in the free floating independent arbitrator and counselor so the more the more uh the more limited and uh domestic and narrow uh legal advisors and lawyers who have to say a word within countries are the better for me because the more mandates i will get from them the, and the more money i will make so that would be one way of answering your question but of course you can also see from the way i answer that question that i think nowadays it is simply a, it's simply a must that uh, let's say uh, knowledge and or understanding for international let's say a real um, interfaces between the domestic law and international law uh, are known by a far greater circle of lawyers than used to be it used to be the case just to since you mentioned university of michigan michigan was the first university in the united states which has been followed in that regard by a, a number of others who have introduced a, a mandatory a course which is called transnational law in which a number of professors not just one but a number of professors introduced as subjects for instance the public international lawyer introduces the es essentials then you have some conflict of law people you have comparative law you have a trade lawyer so that every student coming out of the university of michigan law school has at least an idea where he or she could look on to whom they could go and ask questions so th because it's not just Europe, you know, Ann Arbor is in the Midwest and usually the students that get there are not, are pretty limited in their international outlook. But only, I think for every uh, legal education in the world from Munich to Oslo, etc., I think this is really a must nowadays to at least open people's eyes for and, and make them realize that more and more of what they do, even in their domestic stuff, where they would never think of uh, uh, having to do or, uh, international law, that more and more is influenced by international law, but of course also maybe even more by, by European community law. So for me this is no question, this is simply a, a matter of degree, and the more you get of that, the better. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time coming here to Oslo, sharing this interview. You gave me the opportunity to come here on a ship, which yes. was a pleasure, <laughs> because I love ships and there are a few real ships around in the Munich area. We are happy. <laughs> but also I, l I like your questions very much and I like the interest and um, so it was a great pleasure and honor for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to you.